Well, good evening. I think we'll go ahead and start tonight's presentation. I want to first of all thank everyone for making the time to come out this evening and be a part of the dialogue that we're going to have. I would like to start by introducing some of the folks who are seated on stage with me. <clears throat> Coming up the stairs right now is our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum Instruction, Dr. David Young. Next to him is Ms. Mary Lou Glazeman. She's our Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources. And then next to her is Carl Kaser, our Assistant Superintendent for Finance and Business Operations. And so they'll be assisting with some of what we're going to accomplish this evening. In addition to that, we have a number of our board members present this evening. Mr. Bobby Deaton, I saw him. He normally is very tall and stands out in the crowd. There he is, and he's in the back. And uh, Mr. Jones is back there. Thank you for coming out this evening, sir. And I saw Mr. Pagel as well. So thank you folks for coming out this evening. We're going to have a conversation this evening about our uh, budget for the 2012-2013 school year, and we're going to facilitate that really three different ways. You were handed two cards as you came in the door. One of those is a comment card. We'll be collecting those at the end of the evening. On that, you can write anything that you want to make sure we hear. We're reading all these comments, and they will be gathered as input. We also have green question cards, and at a specific point during the presentation, I'll ask you to pass those to the aisle. Those will be collected, then handed off to the assistant superintendents. They'll categorize those, and then I'll start answering those questions according to categories. I will tell you last night, or yesterday afternoon, we tried to categorize those, and I was going to answer one or two out of each category, because most folks ask similar questions. And it didn't quite work out that way, so I ended up answering every single question. I want you to be confident that we're going to address the topics that you bring up to the best of our ability this evening. Okay. The third thing is I, at some point in the evening and later in the presentation, I'm going to tell you about some surveying we're going to be doing. And so that's three different ways we're going to glean some initial input this evening. What we're sharing with you this evening is our current thinking in relationship to 2012-2013 budget. Part of the reasons we're having these conversations is so that we can get some input from our community. We're in the process of gathering input from our staff. And then we'll take that data and put it together. We will share it with our board and then at that point determine next steps on additional input we might want to gather or what we might want to do next, okay? All right. Before we start talking about 2012-2013, let's take a look back at where we were this time a year ago. I think it's important to remember that at this time last year, the district had a budget deficit of about $4.5 million. And we shared with our staff and our community who went onto website at the time the spreadsheet that's in front of you, we saved about $1.8 million by reducing the size of our staff by 33 professional positions. Now, we, we didn't fire anybody, we didn't go into a RIF, we did all that through resignation and retirements. And as those positions opened up, we just didn't fill them and we got smaller. And we accomplished that primarily by asking our teachers in grades 5 through 12 to teach 6 out of 7 classes instead of 5 out of 7 classes. We, we quite literally asked our people to do a little more with less, and so we, that was the biggest chunk of savings we had last year. We saved another $720,000 a year ago by not purchasing any route buses out of that year's budget. We had bought some in advance so we could be ready for this school year, but we've actually not purchased any school buses, regular route school buses, out of this year's budget, and that saved us $720,000. We saved another $460,000 or so by reducing the size of our paraprofessional staff. And our staff sort of falls into two broad categories, our professional folks and our non-professional folks, and so we saved some money there. We uh, were more efficient in the way that we dealt with our food services, saved $100,000 there. I'm going to briefly go through some of the rest of these. We saved $100,000 with an energy management plan, turning the lights off more, turning the computers off more, asking our teachers to unplug the Christmas lights and the coffee pots. Uh, charging them a small fee if they want to have one appliance in their room, like a coffee pot. And so we saved about, actually more than $100,000 there, and I'll talk more about that later. We reduced our, the use of our substitutes. One of the comments that uh, is often discussed when you have these types of conversations in a school is, well, why don't we travel less and save money on travel? We did that, and that, has, that creates two types of savings. One, you don't spend the money on travel sending teachers to get professional development but you also then don't have to pay a sub to be in the class for the day that they miss. So we're projecting to save about $150,000 there. We reduced a position at the central office. We eliminated local no charge days, which is a benefit our teachers had had in the past. We reduced the size of our campus budgets. We asked our campus to do a little more with less, and so we, they had a little less money to operate on. We eliminated a professional position at the high school. We completely eliminated the district level printing cost. 
We had in the past created some pretty interesting marketing materials and we'd mail those to your houses. We don't do that anymore, not from our office. Occasionally you'll get something from a booster club or whatever, but at the central office we completely eliminated that and we've replaced it with things like the Midway app, Facebook, Twitter, and redesigned our, web our uh, website so we can still communicate with our community in a much more efficient manner. Uh, we reduced costs at the central administrative building. We um, completely eliminated our convocation cost and eliminated a, another part-time position. Athletics was projected to save $20,000. They saved $26,213, mostly through reduced travel. So anyway, <clears throat> we were trying to save about $3.7 million last year, and uh, we're going to get the rest of that $4.5 million from fund balance, which is like a school savings fund. That's a, an oversimplification, but that's the easiest way to sort of keep up with it. We actually saved $3.8 million. And the difference between the $4.5 million shortfall we had last year and the $3.8 million we actually saved was taken out or will be taken out of our fund balance to make up that difference. We had three primary goals last year, close the budget shortfall without interrupting our academic programs and only making personnel reductions through attrition. So learning to live within our means while dealing with our employees and our community in a way that's compassionate. What's our current condition? As you know, public schools all across the state of Texas are facing a shortage of funds because of the way they redid the funding formula in the 82nd legislature. We are not immune to that. We are short about $3.5 million, and I'm gonna detail why. We lost $1.2 million of edu jobs funding. We received a one-time grant for $1.2 million that we were able to include in last year's budget that we will not be able to include in the 2012-2013 budget. $1.2 million decrease in state revenue. So we, we're actually receiving less money from the state due to the change in the way that they're funding public schools. And then about a $1.1 million loss due to flat enrollment. And I, I need to talk about this for just a second. The way funding works in public schools in Texas, each student brings with them to our schools about uh, roughly $6,000. So for every student, we get $6,000 in state funding to help educate that child. Um, we have, for the last six or seven years, grown by somewhere between 250 and 300 students in this district. People move into this area. Yeah, we're all proud of the schools in this area, and so our enrollment's always gone up. Our enrollment was actually flat this year. It did not go up. And so the budgeted revenue we thought we'd make on the increased students has not come in. Based on this year's flat enrollment, we've adjusted next year's budget so that we also are projecting flat enrollment, no student increase. And so that's costing us about $1.1 million. I want to talk to you a little bit about the process that we've used to come to the point where we are this evening. We uh, never really quit talking about the budget um, since December of last year. In December, we first started getting word out of Austin that we were going to face significant budget reductions. Central administrative office team, campus administrators, teachers, we started having this dialogue and we really haven't stopped to be honest. On January 12th, we met with our principals and directors to brainstorm additional budget reduction strategies and assign a level of importance to each strategy. Some have wondered why we waited to January and frankly that was to start to gauge how effective this year's implementation of our budget reduction strategies were and we saw that we'd actually exceeded expectation in some areas. That was important data before we started trying to tackle the 2012-2013 budget. We sent an email to all of our staff on January 17th soliciting input. We told them if they had a great idea to please share it with the principal and director. The executive leadership team considered all of this input and we drafted a plan that we shared with our board on January 25th of 2012. We accepted their guidance and direction, um, crafted the plan based on some of the feedback that we received at that meeting and then shared with our principals the results of the meeting that we had with our board of trustees on the 27th. And then on February 1st, we had our first of two meetings with our faculty to share some of the information I'll be sharing with you tonight. So that's the process we've used to this point, and this is just another step in that process this evening. We'll talk a little bit about the actual plan. What are we actually gonna try and do to bring down the size of our budget? When most folks see this nice yellow picture up here, they, they think of a bus. Um, those of us who work with schools day to day, 
Think of a $95,000 capital expender. E each brand new bus is worth about $95,000. $95,000 will buy you about two teachers. And at our elementary level, we have a 1 to 22 ratio such that each of our teachers represents about 22 students. Um, at the high school, our, our, we have teachers who will see 130 to 150 students in a day. And so when we talk about teachers, uh, what's really on my mind is the lives of the children that they affect and the impact that they can have on young learners. And I know that that's the goal that we all share in this room is to take care of students and protect the instructional integrity that we've had such a, a successful job of being able to create here in Midway. We currently have 10 campuses in the Midway Independent School District. All but one of them uses busing service. It's a little known fact that Hewitt Elementary, all of the students are within two miles of that school. So we actually don't have any buses that go to Hewitt Elementary except for the special education buses. What we currently do is have our buses leave the bus barn at about the same time, go pick up all of the students in the district and deliver them to the campuses at roughly the same time. All of our schools either start at 8 o'clock or 8.10. So they make one big run, pick them all up and deliver them to their campuses. That requires a pretty good number of buses, and remember, a bus is worth about $95,000, brand new. So our current model of transportation is called single-tiered busing. It requires the use of numerous buses. Numerous buses requires numerous bus drivers. We purchase approximately eight regular route buses a year to maintain an average bus age in our fleet of 15 years. <clears throat> You figure eight buses times $95,000 is $760,000 a year. That's worth about 14 teachers. We are currently $3.5 million short if we add no additional buses. Another way to say that, and this is key to our conversation, if we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to be short about $4.4 million. What if there were a more efficient way to transport students to school? <clears throat> What if we sent half the buses out to pick up half of our students, deliver them to their school, go back out to the community, pick up the other half, approximately the other half, come back and then deliver them to their campuses? This is called two-tiered busing. We'd use approximately half the buses with approximately half the drivers. We'd spend less money on transportation and more money on teachers. And teachers are the folks who make an impact on the everyday lives of our students. As I said, this is called two-tiered busing. It requires the use of two different start times for your campuses in your ISD. It would greatly reduce the number of buses and bus drivers, and it would save us $1.5 to $2 million over the next two years by the time you look at the savings of the buses and the personnel. If you take the number of buses we use, the number of drivers we use and slice that in half, there's about $110,000 a year in personnel savings. That's worth roughly 18 to 20 teachers. And it would save MISD hundreds of thousands of dollars thereafter. So we would have to make no bus purchases this year, no bus purchases next year. And in the following years, instead of needing to buy eight at a time, we'd probably be able to buy somewhere between two or three to accomplish that average age of about 15 years in our bus fleet. And we can do this without interrupting the programs we currently offer. We can do this without cutting counselors, without cutting librarians, without cutting art teachers. So there's a, two ways that we've considered doing this to this point, and plan A is what's on the uh, screen right now. It would have the middle school and the high school start at 7.35 a.m., and they'd be out at 3.05 a.m., uh, p.m., I'm sorry, they'd be released at 3.05 in the afternoon. The students would be dropped off at 7.15 a.m., so they'd be picked up. Now our, and this is a key point, and I'm going to talk about this more in a second. It takes about an hour for us to run a route and pick up half of our students. So the earliest student in this model will be picked up about 6.15 a.m. to be dropped off at 7.15 a.m. Those buses would then leave and go back out to the community, run the second, pick up the second tier of students, and then deliver them at the intermediate and elementary schools to be dropped off at 8.15 a.m. Now we need to have those students there about 20 minutes before school because the number of students we have who rely on school to provide them with their breakfast. So we have to, and it provides us a little cushion too for those mornings when things run a little bit slower. On plan A, we would open the campus doors at the middle school and high school at 7 a.m. And at the intermediate and elementary schools, we would open the campus doors at 7.15 a.m. 
We'll let y'all look at that for a minute. <clears throat> There's some benefits to doing it this way. Secondary students can watch younger siblings after school. By getting out at 305, they'd be available to provide care for their younger siblings. They could start homework earlier or have, some t or have additional time to have a part-time job. Our demographics are changing. We have more and more students who uh, rely on those part-time jobs to be able to meet their needs or contribute to their families. 70% of our secondary students in the middle school and the high school participate in UIL activities. These students will miss less instructional time when they're traveling to these after-school events. When, when we talk about UIL activities in Texas, so often we sort of automatically think about Friday night football. But the group that said this would benefit the most are probably freshmen, seventh graders, and eighth graders who oftentimes play games at five o'clock in the afternoon. And by moving more of the school day earlier, they would miss less instructional time sitting in a bus going to or coming back from a game. In addition to that, their coaches who travel with them would, less miss, would miss less of their class time that they would use to instruct students. So the way it works now is when our, bus, when our coaches load up the buses to take the athletes away, a substitute stays behind to offer instruction. And so this would help uh, alleviate that. It's sort of an unintended positive consequence. Elementary and intermediate students uh, will not be waiting at the bus stops as early in the morning when it's darker and cold. Um, as I mentioned before, if you, let's say you considered the inverse and you had the elementary starting at 7.35 a.m. You could theoretically have a kindergarten or first grade age student at the curb waiting for a bus as early as 6.15 in the morning. And, the, and I find the thought of that to be concerning. And then high school drivers will be off the roads prior to morning commuters by being in and set by 7.30 and then out at 3. Uh, we think that that could also have some positive effects on Hewitt Drive. It seems like as long as I've worked in this district, there's been a concern about the traffic on Hewitt Drive and comments about what can y'all do to help this. So There is a plan B. It's almost the exact flip of plan A. It would have the high school and middle school starting later, 835, and getting out at 405. The intermediate and elementaries would start at 7.35 a.m. and the intermediate out at 2.55. Elementary school is out at 2.45. Campus doors would open at the high school and middle school at 7.30 a.m. And campus doors would open at the intermediate and elementary schools at 7 a.m. <clears throat> there are some benefits to looking at this a different way. Elementary and intermediate students will have less free time prior to instruction in the morning. And then second student, secondary students would have less time unsupervised in the afternoons. Traffic patterns uh, may be a little more convenient for parents dropping off students. You know, one of the, one of the issues with a student getting out at 2.55 in the afternoon who's kindergarten, first, second, third grade is you might be sending a latchkey latch child home to an empty house as early as three o'clock in the afternoon. And so for little bitty kiddos, that can be concerning. On the other hand, as a person who's uh, both taught and worked in middle schools, there are concerns that can be equally um, as notable for a seventh grader going to an empty house at three o'clock in the afternoon. So if you've had a seventh grader, you know what I'm talking about. The plan B benefits. Uh, the list doesn't appear to be as long, but I understand that they're equally as weighty and will need to be considered as thoughtfully. How would we deal with the after-school care on either one of these two plans? We'd be outsourcing our after-school care program to a licensed provider and we'd have a projected cost of about $50 a week for after-school care. When I say about, it's because there's a number of mitigating factors and one is the group that we're talking to right now is it's, they're called Kids and Company. They're in a number of our ISDs right now. They, uh, they do offer some scholarships and they work with an organization. Carl, you're going to have to remind me the name of this, but you can fill out paperwork almost like we do on free reduced lunch now. And uh, they have a sliding scale for economically disadvantaged folks. And so that would help bring the price of that down just a little bit. So we'd still continue to offer after, offer after school care. This group would also be willing to provide care at the middle school. If the middle school were to release at the early time, if they had at least 25 students interested in taking advantage of that service. So they're willing to work with us uh, grades K through 8, pre-K through 8 actually. These are difficult decisions to try and process. I've been thinking about this almost nonstop, literally since December of last year. So is the administrative team, so of our principals. 
And, um, you know, we have our thoughts on this, but we are, we are not so arrogant as to think that we have all the answers on our own. As you walk out this evening, you will be handed a yellow piece of paper that looks like this. It came home in elementary and intermediate backpack materials today. We sent it home with the other students, but I'm not so naive as to think that high school students bring backpack materials home in the same manner that elementary kiddos do. And what this does is it basically takes you through the last several slides talking about plan A and plan B. And at the top informs you that on the evening of Sunday, February the 12th, between 6 and 8 p.m., you're going to receive a phone call from the district. What that call will do is prompt you to press one of three buttons by way of your recording input on these topics. So it'll say press one for plan A, plus two for plan B, press three if you have no preference. Okay? I'm telling you uh, that we are, the system tells us that we have to give a two hour window for those phones to ring. I will tell you that today, any time that we've activated the telebearance system, we've been able to call all our homes within about 30 or 45 minutes. So we're doing a phone survey on this. There's been, there, I want to explain to you why we're doing it this way too. And it's primarily because we want to get input from our community in a way that's equitable. And we know that we have more phones in our community than we do computers. And so we just want to make sure we give everybody a chance to press one of these buttons. So Sunday night, be waiting on a phone call from the school and uh, record your input. We really want to know. Okay. I readily acknowledge that that's a significant change for our community and our teachers and our ISD. And so it begs the question, can't you find the money somewhere else? And the answer to that is yes, and we had better because I would remind you that two-tiered busing does nothing to bring down the $3.5 million we're still short. So let's talk about the remaining part and if we have another, uh, another uh, slideshow, another um, spreadsheet, I'm sorry, to show you. Now let me warn you in advance that when I am through with this slide, I'm going to ask you to pass your, comment or your question cards to the aisle. So if you've been sitting on a question thinking maybe he'll answer it in a minute, um, this is the time to go ahead and write it down because when we're through with this slide, I'm going to ask you to pass those to the aisle. So I'm going to talk about this for a few minutes and we're going to come pick those up. One of the things that we've done is eliminate hard to fill or we're proposing is the elimination of hard to fill personnel position stipends worth $332,000. That's worth roughly six teachers. I want to talk to you about this for a minute because it's sort of complicated. We provide in Midway right now two types of stipends, and one is a stipend associated with extra duties performed by our teachers. And the classic example is the coach who teaches during the day and spends numerous hours in the afternoon and evenings coaching. And so we provide them a stipend or additional money because they perform an additional service. The stipend would also apply to department chairs, team leaders, other folks who do additional work. We have in the past had another type of stipend that's associated with hard to fill content positions. There was a time in the state of Texas where we just could not find enough quality secondary math and secondary science teachers, uh, special education teachers, ELL, and a number of other groups and categories. 32,000 teachers lost their job in the state of Texas last year. They're projecting that more teachers will lose their jobs this year. In talking with Baylor, they're telling us that we're going to have one of the largest crops of math and science teachers come out of Baylor that we've seen in several years. And the harsh reality is that because of the state of education in Texas right now, we no longer have what you call a hard to fill teacher position. And so to continue to give a stipend for which there's no logical justification um, doesn't seem like it's fair in, in the light of what we're asking our community to consider in terms of these tiered uh, busing schedules and what it would do to school start times. Staff analysis and a, and a reduction through attrition. We think we can reduce the size of our staff by about another 14 to 18 positions. Now I want to emphasize here that our plan is still to do that by attrition, which means as people resign or retire, we just don't fill their positions. Okay. And the way we think we can accomplish that this year is by being tighter with our staffing formulas. And let me, let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Right now, the average class size of, an L of a K-4 class in Midway ISD is 19.7 students, largely because of our emphasis on trying to maintain neighborhood schools. 
We feel like if we can get that average up to 20.7 students, well below the 22 to 1 ratio required by the state, but also we think attainable, that would actually save us eight teachers in our elementary schools. A similar type of analysis has led us to believe that we can reduce the size of our intermediate staffs, middle school staff, and high school staff. So just being a little bit um, tighter with the way that we put our controls in place on our staffing formula. Still provide the programs that we're providing, still taking care of students, um, but just being a little bit tighter with the way that we uh, look at our staffing. We feel like we can save between 3.5 and 4.5 positions at either the administrative or district level worth about $210,000. I've mentioned before the $110,000 savings due to personnel and operation cost if we went to two-tiered busing. <clears throat> $50,000 on energy savings. Uh, you heard me mention earlier that we saved $100,000 this year. We're actually exceeding that. If, if the projections hold, we think we can actually save about $140,000 doing just what we've done this year. We are already putting steps in place to be more efficient with our money on energy and utilities for next year. For example, Mr. Kaser is working with some of our trash collection services to think about how they charge us when we're on spring break and over Christmas break. We can obviously reduce the number of pickups because we don't have kids in school. He's talking to our electricity providers and renegotiating contracts there. We feel like we're going to be able to achieve some savings uh, in those contracts as well, so we're confident we're going to be able to reach that goal. Reducing the local effort on special education, I need to talk about for a minute because it sounds like we're not going to fund special ed, and I want to make it clear that that is not the case. But we have grant monies from the federal government, and we have local effort money. That's money we get from the state. We can shift some of that money from one of those categories to the other and free up our local money to apply to our debt problem. So it's, it's, it's an oversimplification, but it's not unfair to say it's literally like taking money out of one bucket and moving it to another. And by executing that process, be able to free some money up to apply toward our debt. We're going to reduce our capital projects by $100,000. In the past, we have budgeted about $250,000 a year for things like new paint, new tile, new carpet, and lights, just the repairs that uh, a district the size of ours needs. We think that we can reduce that. We've spent a lot of money on our facilities lately, as you're aware, and we think we can afford to reduce that and still provide a safe learning environment for your students. Non-personnel operating budgets, as you can imagine, in a district the size of this one, we spend a little bit of money on paper, paper clips, markers, pens, pencils. We feel like we can cut that by at least $150,000. And then we have an after-school care program right now called Panther Kids, and over the years, it's been in place for a long time, and every year they put a little bit back in case they ever need to make a large expenditure to help that program run. By outsourcing the, the after-school care program to a third-party provider, we'd be able to take that $200,000 and apply it to our debt. And so that's one of the things we're talking about. When you're out of money, you can do one of two things, spend less or generate more. We have had conversations about additional revenue generation. We've talked about a number of things, bus advertising, something that's popular across the state. Um, those are, it's difficult to predict how much money you'll actually generate doing something like that. We're, we're exploring these options and we think that we can make some money one thing that we know we can do that will make money is accept transfers. I would mention, uh, like I did earlier, that every student's worth about $6,000 who comes to our district. I want to talk about transfers for just a second. <clears throat> there is concern in our community at times about certain individuals that appear to be coming into the district in ways that are not um, justifiable, okay? And we do have those issues at times, uh, folks who come into our district um, in ways that are not completely lawful. That's not what this is. When we set a transfer policy, when our board sets a transfer policy, they are legally allowed to put very strict guidelines on who comes in. So for example, we can say, you will not be considered for transfer if you have discipline issues. You will not be considered for transfer if you've not passed all portions of the, your, your last state assessment. You can't be accepted for transfer if your grades don't reach a certain level. So we can put pretty strict cr criteria in place. The district has accepted transfers in the past under those sorts of policies. And when those students come to our district, they typically achieve very well academically and provide almost no in, in, interruption to instruction or disruption in our schools. So I don't want us to confuse these two issues. Um, as we think about them. 
So that would bring us to a savings of $2.285 million, which is still not enough. <clears throat> and as counterintuitive as it may see, seem, we're actually dis discussing adding an employee assistance program for $30,000. That's spending money, not saving it. I want to talk about that for just a second, too. Currently, the Midway Independent School District offers nothing to our employees by way of any type of counseling or assistance they may need as they face the difficult issues that we all face in life. It's, I think, especially germane to our conversation this year because of the number of employees that we have. I can think of three right off the top of my head who are struggling with life-threatening illnesses. Some of these the community is aware of, some of them they are not. And this causes significant hardship for our folks. And, and that's just the stuff we know about. We know that our, our teachers are heroes, but they're also humans. And so they have marital issues, they have money issues. They need to be able to visit with somebody that helps them maintain their mental health so that they're in the best place they can possibly be from a mental perspective when they're dealing with our children. And our, this is an area in which our board has shown extraordinary leadership and compassion. They asked us to show them what it would cost to add an employee assistance program. And we've taken some bids and it looks like that cost about $30,000. So we're looking at adding that. If you do that, that's $2.25 million of reduction. That's still not 3.5. That still leaves us $1.2 million short. That $1.2 million would be covered um, by our fund balance, most likely. Our board has expressed a willingness to use some of our fund balance to bring us into a balanced budget again for 2012-2013. They recognize that a number of the issues that we're talking about up here are significant, but they also would like to maintain the sanctity of our classroom. And to achieve that next $1.2 million would require fairly severe and deep personnel cuts that would have an impact on the educational programs we currently offer in the district. At this time, if you please start passing your question cards to the aisle, we'll pick those up. And our folks up here at the tables will start sort of sorting through those. They're just going to come up and down the aisle so you can pass them to the outside. Yes, ma'am? Pen? We can take care of that, I think. Thank you, Ms. Pagel. While your cards are coming in, I want to address some frequently asked questions. I've worked in four different districts, and this is not exactly the first time that I have seen this conversation take place, and there's some questions that have the tendency to come up time and again. Why not use the fund balance? I think I've discussed this enough tonight for you to realize that our board has expressed a willingness to use our fund balance to gradually bring our district to a place where we start living within our new means as defined by the legislature. Um, there is a balance that must be struck there. There is a way to use fund balance that allows the district to move at a pace that uh, our community can deal with as we embrace some of these challenges. However, like any savings account, you don't want to just drain it. If you, then you would be in dire straits if you had a catastrophic issue, not unlike what we saw happen at the start of this year with Spiegelville Elementary. Because we had some fund balance, we could very quickly address some financial issues while waiting on our insurance company to reimburse us. How can we renovate Panther Stadium in the administration building and still have a budget shortfall? I'm going to give you an oversimplified answer to this question, but let me just put it to you this way. The law does not allow us to use bond funds to pay personnel that teach and instruct in your classes every day. You just can't use bond money to deal with the maintenance and operation of your district. When we go to the voters for bond, we list the things that we're going to use that money for. You vote yes or no on it. And if you vote yes, then we have to use the money on those things. And so um, it can be very confusing for folks to sort of see all this going on and think, well, my gosh, how, how can we be doing all this and be out of money? It's, com it's two completely different sources of money. Matter of fact, the good thing about bonds is that when you pass a bond and you tax your community to receive that money, all the money stays in Midway, OK? You know about Robin Hood and all that. There's a certain amount of money in local revenue, your taxes, that end up are, are recaptured and go to the state. And so uh, that's part of the reason you, you have to think about these things very differently. Why not cut administration? We have. We cut some last year. We're cutting more this year. 
I would also have you consider, though, the fact that administration, those people work, they do jobs. A lot of it's associated with the administrivia that goes along with receiving federal grants, receiving federal monies. There's a lot of data that we have to collect and report on. Um, when a parent calls a school and says, somebody's picking on my kid, they want somebody to go fix that problem. That's an administrator. When an administrator uh, or when a parent is unhappy with the principal, they want to be able to call somebody and say, this principal's not doing things that they need to do. That would be an administrator. When a teacher is not doing their job in a way that it supports instruction and helps our students grow and achieve, it takes an administrator to get in there and evaluate that situation and hold the teachers accountable. So it is something that we're doing, but as with everything else, we have to do it in a way that doesn't disrupt our ability to maintain the high standard of excellence that we've achieved in this district. Why not eliminate programs such as athletics, replace that with band, CTE? There, there tends to be the program that someone thinks is not valuable. And I, I will tell you that, that the reason that these types of decisions are held off until you're in absolute dire straits, like more dire than we're talking about tonight, is because of two reasons. And one is this district has expressed a commitment to educating the whole child, mind, body, and spirit. And it is through a number of these enriching programs that we accomplish that goal. The second thing I would say is this. I, I've been doing this for 16 years. I've never had a child run up to me in the hall and say, I can't tell you, Dr. Allen, how excited I am to talk about ambic pentameter in class today. It doesn't happen. They will come up to me in the hall and say, I'm excited about my recital tonight. I'm excited about the game tonight. Can I tell you what cool thing I learned while doing rotations at the hospital? So these are the programs that keep our students committed to dealing with reading, writing, and arithmetic. Okay. What about research saying that late start times help teenage students? I read the research. I, I have no question with that. I'm, I'm actually sure that's probably not false. But there's, there's two issues we have to deal with when talking about this. First of all, as you know, we are already not aligning our practice with this research. The research would indicate that school would have to start for teenage students after 8.30. We currently start at 8 or 8.10. And if you're the parent of a seventh grader or ever been the parent of a seventh grader or a ninth grader, you know that they're rolling in early for athletics and extracurricular events anyway. In addition to that, if you've ever had a student who took first credit, dual credit, first period, dual credit courses, you know they're rolling in pretty early. And we seem to be outperforming the state in every statistical measure that's academic. We outperform in tax, we outperform in SAT, we outperform in ACT. The other thing I would say, and this is, this is the much more difficult part of this conversation, but there's actually a lot of research that we don't align to in this profession because it's not affordable. There's a lot of research that says students achieve much better when the student to teacher ratio is lower, like one to 10-ish or so. Well, instead of reducing our staff, we'd have to more than double it to achieve that goal for all of our learners. There's research that indicates that students perform better on mathematics when they receive music instruction, and yet music instruction is not compulsory. So, and that, that's just two. I could, I could cite a lot of research for you, both educational and organizational, that we just don't align to because, and here's, here's really the point I'm trying to make, all research must be evaluated within the context of your current condition. And our current condition is one that makes our financial issue one that we have to look at very deeply while we're making these decisions. Is there any reason to think state uh, levels will restore? Um, no, mostly. I'm, I'm going to hedge on that a little bit. Let me tell you why. I talked to a person uh, out of uh, Representative Flores' office, and I asked him this question. I said, look, I'm going to go talk to our community. Is anything going to get better in the next biennium? And his answer was, there's no reason to believe it is. If you've read the paper, you know the state's already talking about being $1.5 billion short for the next biennium. Now, the reason I hedge is because we are suing the state. By we, I mean the school districts of the state of Texas. There are 1,042 districts in the state. About 500 of them have joined one of four different lawsuits to sue the state of Texas because of their failure to provide the funds necessary to provide for the general diffusion of knowledge. So uh, I, there's, I guess there's a chance, depending on what the courts do, that things might get better. But we also are, are receiving information that suggests that that court process will not be concluded until maybe late 2014. 
So um, I, I hope things get better, and I hope they get better fast, but I'm, we are obligated to be realistic with this conversation. Isn't there some other way to trim the fat? Um, well, I think we've done some fat trim, trim in the last two years. If you take the 33 professional positions we reduced last year and the 14 we're suggesting reduce this year, that's over 47 teaching positions. We employ approximately 500. That's close to a 10% reduction in the size of our staff. The numbers hold true for our central administration as a percentage of the whole. But I want to show you some other things that I find interesting when we talk about trimming the fat in Midway. This data is from 2009-2010, and the reason that's important is the, this data is from before the days when we were reducing the size of our budget because of an adjusted state funding formula, okay? In other words, this is back when we weren't talking about money so much. And even then, back in those days, we were spending less money per pupil than what we're calling our average peer. And I don't know how many of you folks are aware of this, but on the tax test, they report data to us telling us how our kids did, and they tell us how our kids did compared to schools that they say are like us, socioeconomically, demographically, size, the whole nine yards. They compare us to a subset of schools. And we underspend from 2005 to 2010 almost all of our peers. Now, what I think is pretty remarkable about that is what you see on this next slide. When you look at district performance rating, exemplary, recognized, acceptable, unacceptable, that rating that we're sort of used to reading about in the paper, midway is right there. So as you move up, the rating gets better. As you move across, you spend more money. So, you know, according to this chart, when you take all operating costs, you divide it by the number of students, we spend, you know, roughly $7,600 a student, roughly when you take all the cost. And look at where we're sitting on the achievement level. The only folks who are outperforming us are Lake Travis and Carroll, and they spend almost $1,000 more per child than Midway does in 2009-2010. Here's another way of looking at it. It looks like almost the exact same slide, but the difference here is SAT scores. We spend far less money and are only slightly outperformed by those spending all the extra money. And so we're now going to talk about question cards a little bit, but the reason I want you to see those last slides is I, I want you to have an appreciation for the fact that if you think about it in just sort of the cold, hard return on investment analysis, even before the budget cuts, Midway is one of the best returns on investment you can find in Central Texas and we're running leaner, and we're running trimmer, and we're trying to do everything we can to live within our means while protecting our educational programs so that we can continue to have results like that for our students. With that, I'm gonna take one more sip of this, and then we're gonna start looking at some questions. Okay. Did you say that the two-tiered bus schedule would not offset the 2012-2013 budget shortfall? What it would do is keep that budget shortfall at $3.5 million instead of allowing it to increase to $4.4 million. Okay, I'm gonna say that one more time. Two-tiered busing makes our budget shortfall fall 3.5 instead of 4.4. Assuming that we continue to be committed to a goal of a 15-year-old um, bus fleet. I'm gonna stand over here, if y'all don't mind, where I can set these cards down as I go through them. Would two-tier busing put too much wear and tear on the buses to still last 15 years? That's a good question. We've actually done a lot of talk about this and, and we've analyzed this quite a bit. Um, and, and, I, and I wanna talk about that a little bit too. I don't want y'all to think that we've done this analysis in isolation. There are two transportation experts in the state that we've sort of been consulting with and we've spent some time with them. They've actually visited our district and, and driven around a little bit and helped us craft this, uh, this plan. But you don't actually put twice as much wear and tear on a bus because you, re you reduce the number of deadhead miles. And, and here's what I mean. On a single tiered busing, the buses leave the bus barn, they go pick up the children, they drop the children off, okay? At the end of the school day, 
well, they, some of the buses go back to the bus bar and some stay on campus depending on the driver and the campus situation. But anyway, at the end of the day, they take the students back out to their homes and then deadhead all the way back. On two-tiered, they would leave the bus barn and deadhead miles to pick the students up. Okay, with students on the bus, bring them back to their schools, but the schools are already going to be located within neighborhood context, many of them, depending elementary, intermediate, or high school, right? And then they go right back out into the community, so you reduce your deadhead miles, so you don't actually get a doubling effect. Would it, would it use the buses up more? Yes, it would. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to say that it doesn't put any more miles or any more tread off a tire, but what I'm trying to suggest is that according to the analysis that we've done, or that's been done and shared with us and that we've looked at and reviewed, there would be a net gain by going to two-tiered busing. That's a, that's a great question, though. All right, this is a similar question. If bus drivers are paid hourly, how would two-tiered busing save personnel costs? There's still the same amount of driving time. Actually, there's not because of those deadhead miles I mentioned earlier. But second of all, it has something to do with numbers of drivers. Actually, using fewer drivers saves you some money. Um, each individual, individual driver may do a little more than what one would do, but you still realize the savings overall. In addition to that, and, and this, is, this is the difficult stuff to talk about, but if you're not employing a driver and you're not paying them an hourly rate, that means you're also not paying the associated benefits and things that go along with the wage. So, but again, another good thought. All right, if the rainy day fund or our fund balance is what I'm assuming we're talking about there, is tapped two times, how many more times can it be tapped into? The question, and, and I'm not, you know, that's a difficult question to answer because it is, well, how much money are we taking out each time? So at the rate we're using our, our uh, fund balance, you know, I, I, Carl, would you have any way of guessing if we, if we use about $1.5 to $2 million of fund balance a year to try and shore up, how many more times can we do that before we start to run up against our board set goal for the size of that fund balance? Okay. Okay. So for those of you guys who didn't have, we might be able to go into our fund balance as much as 12 years now. That would drain it to zero, okay? Which we wouldn't, we wouldn't allow that to happen. But so that, that's a good. All right. Okay, I'm just gonna read this, it's a comment, and I'm, I think there's a question in here. Okay, what this says is that neither plan A nor plan B is acceptable. I'm gonna do some summarizing here. Students getting up that earlier is not a good idea. This is a very, very drastic change. We have a sizable fund balance. Couldn't we use some of this for the next couple of years? Um, and then reassess the situation. We have a situation where we're facing a significant budget shortfall. Our board is committed to being financially responsible and trying to train our district to live within the means that we have available. Could we do that? I guess we could. That's just not part of the conversation that we're having right now. This, but this is the sort of input we're looking for. So I appreciate that. All right, clarify if Panther Kids program after, the, the after school would be eliminated in both plan A and plan B. And the answer to that is yes. Partly because I talked about our ability to free up that Panther Kids fund balance to apply to our debt. And there's a couple other reasons too. The, pan, the uh, kids and company would license our after school care programs which we think is important. And then second of all, managing the after-school care program actually creates an administrative burden. And so when you want to successfully reduce the size of your administration, you have to reduce some of the administrivia that goes along with it. Uh, would high school students have a place in the new program? Some, not as many as currently do, but some. Is it unusual to have a fund balance account as strong as ours? Um, that's, I, I, don't, I can't tell you what everybody's fund balance in the state is. I will tell you that when we showed you that comparison slide, those districts who are performing at the levels close to the, the levels we are have fund balances that look like ours. <clears throat> a 
Okay, how many student how many student families are within the two mile area and can't use the bus, meaning parents must drive or will MISD allowing all students to ride the bus? I don't think that we'll allow all students to ride the bus. This is also a confusing issue. I want to talk about this a little bit. It's a funding issue, to be frank. We are reimbursed by the state a certain amount of transportation cost for the students that we transport who are more than two miles from their school. Once you come within that, then you start to take on a funding um, burden. I will tell you there are some districts in the state who are allowing students within the two mile radius to ride buses for a charge. It's usually about, what I've seen ranges between $150 and $185 a semester. We feel like that's pretty cost prohibitive. How many folks do we, having, do we have living inside that two mile area? I don't have that data, but we can gather that for you. <clears throat> what will you do to voice your opinion on start times when no one will be home on Sunday? Talk to me and I'll make sure it gets included. You can email me or talk to me. <clears throat> Why are there options to start at 7.35 and 8.35 instead of 8 and 9? Uh, part of that is because if we started at 9, that would push our afternoon release for our high school kids beyond 4.30, at or beyond 4.30 in the afternoon. And then that starts to create another set of prohibiting factors. I will remind you that because of the number of students we have that are involved in extracurricular events and activities, that the later you push that school day into the afternoon for those kiddos, the more difficult you make for them to actually be able to successfully complete a school day before they have to leave school and go play football, play basketball, or whatever else. Why can't Midway rent buses? <clears throat> there are some districts that have done that. It brings with it a separate set of challenges. They don't, I don't, they don't rent buses so much as outsource to other companies like Durham or whatever. They pass the cost along. Uh, there's, we've done some slight analysis on this, and it doesn't look like it would give us much of a cost savings. The other, the other problem about doing that is then you are trapped in that situation from a financial point of view. Why would we ignore all the studies about high school kids doing better with late starts? I, I address that in the frequently asked questions. Why don't we make schools less dependent on buses by sending buses to the closest school, i.e. Woodgate versus River Valley? We would, I would have to, we would have to do an analysis of the routes to talk about that a little bit. Those lines were drawn uh, for a reason, and to be honest with you, I'd have to reanalyze that to talk to you about it. I will tell you though, when you've got two intermediate schools, it doesn't matter where you drive that, draw that line, you're gonna have some kids close to one school and some kids who are real far away just because of the nature of only having two of those. The before school care is free at the elementary. Who will be the ones watching the kiddos, the teachers? Uh, a combination of teachers and paraprofessionals. We've done some work with our principals on this. And our, what it looks like, well, based on our current patterns in terms of when children actually start showing up, we open our doors at 715, but we really see the majority of our kids show up somewhere between 7.30 and 7.45. That's when we sort of reach a critical mass on kiddos. And because the school day would end around um, 4, 4.55 for those kiddos on a late start model or 2.55, 4.05 on a late start model or 2.45 uh, or 2.55 on an early start model, that teacher work day would look something like 7.30 a.m. to about 4.05 or so. And so what we see is a scenario where individual teachers would rotate in and help supervise those children and provide them with some extra learning opportunities. And, and I'm not talking about cracking the whip, sitting in a row and we're doing a math worksheet, but stuff that's enriching and engaging while the other teachers would be able to continue to do their work and duties. It's pretty common. The high school and the middle school has duty now. Like the teachers are the ones supervising students before school now. So it would be challenge our, our elementary teachers to do what our other staffs are currently doing. This is another question about busing and River, River Valley versus Woodgate, and I've, I've sort of spoken to that already. <clears throat> okay, and that's more of a comment. All right, I've answered that one. This is another one on the research about students and early start times. Did combining Spiegelville with River Valley reduce cost? Uh, we'd have to do analysis on that. I would tell you um, that what 
if we were, if there were no Spigabel Elementary at all, then there might, that might be some thought to that. But because the school was in existence and we were able to renovate and repair that school using insurance funds to, to close that campus, which is sort of the direction this is going, we don't think would be best for the students at this point. Athletic cuts, yes, they're involved in this plan. That's, the, that's that non-personnel budget cuts that we discussed. Impact of, district, oh, impact of district change. Yeah, we got lucky. When we went 5A, it reduced the size geographically of our travel. Like, I don't know if any of you in here have a high school athlete or whatever, that, that whole trip to San Angelo was, was something else this year. So that, that, will, that will help us quite a bit not having to go out that far. However, our success is such that we go a couple rounds in the playoffs and doggone near everything. And so there's always going to be some travel associated with athletics that's going to be fairly significant. I'll also remind you of the fact that our 7th and 8th graders have currently been competing against a number of the same schools that are in our new 5A district. They play games at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, so it has an impact on our students and the amount of time they miss. I just spoke to this question. How long do we expect to um, be receiving a budget shortfall from the state? I can't answer that question. I, know, I spoke to a little bit earlier, do we, think, do we expect things to get better anytime soon? I define soon as the next biennium, and as I said before, it doesn't look like that that's going to get better in a, in a big hurry. I hope I'm wrong. Let me just say that sincerely. We're going 5A, how can we project no enrollment? Let me talk about that because it's sort of confusing. UIL realigns your schools every two years. They capture the data in October. They tell you your new district in February, okay? What happened in Midway is we were a big foray with an enrollment of about 1,970 or so students. Um, and then in one year, we showed about, uh, at, at the high school especially, those are the numbers they look at, it's the high school and middle school, about 200 kid jump in one year. That jump pushed us from 4A to 5A. We were actually still competing at the 4A level because this was in the second year, in going into the second of re year of realignment that we saw that jump. But then that jump occurred, we continued to be in 4A, and they just redistrict us to be 5A. Well, the jump occurred, our enrollment went up, but then it flatlined, okay? So it's not, it's not good enough to just grow, you wanna grow a little every year, and this year we just didn't grow. I know that that's been confusing, I know it's difficult to talk about jumping, or it's confusing to talk about jumping up to 5A, and flatline enrollment at the same time. Will athletic practices still be directly after school if the high school releases at 305? There's no reason to think why not. I have asked our AD to think creatively about all of our, our athletic director. I'm sorry, I gotta quit using alphabet soup. I have asked our athletic director to think creatively about all of our programs considering any of these changes. But at this point, there's, there's no reason to think that, they wouldn't, that the upperclassmen would not continue to work out after school. How can we add transfers without adding teachers? That is a great question. Let me talk about this for a second. Like, like I said before, every student you add is worth roughly $6,000, okay? For every, student that, for every student that comes in, and these are rough approximations again, and Carl, don't let me stray too far from the truth here, okay? But for every student you add, you will spend about 50% of that $6,000 they bring in to meet that student's educational need. The other 50% can then be used for general revenue needs of the district as I described before. It also depends on what grade level. There's a state mandated one to 22 ratio on classrooms unless you get a waiver. And so if you add a student at a particular grade level, and it puts you over the one to 22 student to teacher ratio, then that would affect things one way. That same ratio is not a requirement at the secondary level, so you could have 22 kids sitting in a high school chemistry class, a transfer come in and make that 23, and we would not hire a teacher. Matter of fact, a high school chemistry class of 23s, that's not all that bad. It's an interesting question. Would you consider dropping coaching stipends and let them come a love of the game and move those stipends to the teachers who help promote a love of learning, it might motivate them to grade uh, after hours. Now, I, let me tell you, they're grading after hours now. 
I'll, let me just speak to that, okay? Uh, I guess we could theoretically do that. We wouldn't have coaches anymore. We're in difficult budget situations, but people still don't work for free. And, and I would also say this. If we're going to move that money around to give stipends to teachers, then we'd better give it to all of them. Because when you're in a context where you no longer have hard-to-fill teacher positions, then you need to start teaching math and science and social studies and English and art and health science technology and ROTC and elementary teachers the same. Will middle school sports take place before school, and if so, how early? I was talking to our AD about this, and if we stay, if we stayed on our current model, the early, if, if we did what we're doing now, but came to school earlier, they, he said they'd report 25 to 30 minutes earlier than they currently are. Any thought given to an across-the-board pay cut by a small percentage, example 5%, there are some prohibitions to doing that for contract staff. And so, uh, legally, we're, our hands are a little tied on doing that, is my understanding. Is that correct, Ms. Glazeman? Mary Lou? Didn't we just come out of something in that says you cannot do just an across-the-board 5% cut to professional staff and whatnot? Yes, if you're a professional teacher, yes. Right. Okay. What about 13-14? Are we looking at doing this again next year, where you can only go to two-tiered busing once, I would say that. Are we, are we talking about ways to reduce our budget? Every year in the spring, we have a budget creation process. We formally adopt that budget in August. It is currently, I think it's still February. It's, it's a very long, short month. Um, so we're early in the process. That's why I keep talking about the next steps and where we are now and, and all that and that sort of thing. Um, but every year we have to look at what our funding formula is and we have to determine what to do. So I will say this, we saved a big chunk of money last year when we went from five out of seven to six out of seven. It was like $1.8 million. We became pretty lean there. Uh, we're talking about trying to save another big chunk of money by reducing the amount of money we spend on buses. But, but I will tell you, part of the reason this busing thing's important is 13, 14 and 14, 15 and beyond because these savings roll forward in time. There are one-time savings and savings that roll forward in time. But we have to evaluate our budget every year. And so um, it's just a challenge that we have to face. Now, if the state decides to start giving us a bunch of money again, then, then no, we, we'd be in good shape. We'd have a completely different sort of meeting. <clears throat> we'd be asking y'all how y'all want us to spend it. Have you looked at outsourcing services such as food service, maintenance, lawn care, janitorial? Um, again, we've without affecting curriculum, right? We've looked at some of those things and we don't see a significant cost savings. Teacher retirement reductions, insurance cost reduction, more efficient use of labor. You know, we've looked at all these things. There is a difficult balance and I just, I'm gonna ask you to understand this. These are all great ideas unless you're the teacher who comes to work every day, works with an excess of 150 kids and we're now talking about reducing all your pay and all your benefits and this and the other. We want teachers who wanna to come to work every day, guys. Te teaching students is not only heroic work, it's art. And so I, I think we have, to, we have to think about these things in a balanced way. More efficient use of labor, we talked about that. That's the five out of seven instead of six out of seven. That's thinking differently about our classroom ratios. <clears throat> Will the transfers be distributed equally amongst all campuses? What we normally do, and, and we take, well, the way transfers work is we normally take this conversation to our board and we say, here's sort of what we're thinking. And we look at the enrollment at our campuses and we compare that to what that campus, what that campus's max enrollment could be. And then we make a recommendation based on that. So let me give you two hypotheticals. And these are completely hypotheticals, I'm making them up. So if I happen to be right, don't, don't hold it against me. But let's say South Bosque is at 95% of their quote unquote max attendance. And that max attendance is not based on how many bodies you can cram in a room, but how many students we think we can equitably educate in the environment, okay? And then let's say hypothetically Woodgate, we're at 70%. Well, when we made the recommendation, we'd recommend that we take X number of children at Woodgate and potentially zero at South Bosque, because at 95%, you gotta leave room for natural growth. There, there's liable to be folks who move in and whatnot. You gotta have a seat there. So we look at it on a campus by campus base, basis looked in, looking at our um, projected enrollment. Not that you asked, but you've gotta be asking yourself, how does it work at the high school where you don't have those same ratios? 
the limiting factor there is usually science and computer labs, to, to be frank. If, if we cannot add students to a grade level without pushing us much over 24, 25, somewhere in that range on science and computer labs, then we typically can't take the students because of the way those classrooms are configured. Could we consider charging tuition to transfer students? Yes, we could. And we've had that conversation. This comes up a lot too. Again, none of these decisions have been made. We're considering all sort of things, okay? But I will tell you that part of the deal with transfers is you want the students to come in so you can get the state revenue associated with them. If you're not careful about the tuition you charge in association with that, you literally price yourself out of the market, so to speak. And in a time when families are having the same budget conversations that we're having in Midway, and business owners are having the same budget conversations, and Baylor and everybody else is talking about how to do a little more with a little less, you, you just sort of want to think, you don't want to do something that has the unintended consequence of shooting yourself in the foot. Why do we need three assistant superintendents? Because one of them is currently serving as the interim, <laughs> and because there's a lot of work to do. Can we sell the administrative building and put it in the budget? I don't know. Could we do that? Could we sell the ad building and put the money in the budget? Since, no. okay. Okay, how can, okay, this is a good question. How can a $5 million reduction in budget in the last two years only reduce 20K for athletics? It's actually 26, and they're reducing more this year. Are we not about education first? What type of positions are hard to fill? Okay, there's, there's a lot there. We are about education first, but I'll go back to what I said earlier about the whole child and our need to make sure we think equitably. It's interesting, this question, only 20K for athletics, how much have we cut out of fine arts or any of our other programs? We, we have to be equitable in these things. We have to remember that what one person considers expendable, another person might consider life-saving. Uh, what type of positions are hard to fill? As I said before, now, I would say none. In the old days, like I mentioned before, secondary math, secondary science, certain special education, uh, English language learners, teachers, and, and those, they're hard to fill either one, for one of two reasons. The certification is extremely difficult to get or because of the demand in the market. About how many teachers will be cut through attrition in the middle and high schools? <laughs> it depends. Don't you love that answer? What we have to do is when we have a teacher retire or resign, is then look at the class loads and we use a teacher to student ratio of roughly one to 50. And I say roughly because some of that depends on the programming too. Science says you have to treat a little bit differently because of lab space. You know, at the high school, you have to be real thoughtful about how many kids you want messing with a Bunsen burner at one time. So uh, we do this analysis based on a pretty complex matrix. And um, I, can, I can speak to this in much greater detail if whoever, wants to, whoever wrote this wants to, to catch me. Um, but it's, it's pretty complicated. What will the average classroom size be after these positions are cut in the middle and high schools? We, we feel like we can achieve the sort of reconfiguration that we're talking about with our staff without seeing a significant increase. You, in a district the size of ours, even adding one student to some classes can cause a pretty big ripple effect. Now, you're thinking to yourself, one more kid, you know, there are a few teachers in the room tonight, and they're, and they're thinking to themselves, one more student, you gotta be kidding. You have to look at your loads and your programs and your classes and your number of teachers. We have some of our departments that have 20 teachers in them. We have some of our departments that have 12, and that's for a whole other set of complicated reasons. It has something to do with class sizes, class offerings, how many of the people who teach in that particular content are a coach or not a coach or have other assigned duties. And so we look at this analysis, and here's the other thing you need to know. When we have these conversations, we're talking to your campus principals. It's not like Dr. Young or myself or Mary Lou whatever just sits up there with a green visor and a pencil and starts whacking stuff. We go sit and we say, okay, Jeff, this is what we're thinking, Mr. Gassaway, this is what we're thinking. Tell us what's going on. What's going to be best for your children? Where is there some room to operate and where do we need to leave things alone? And so these, these are collaborative conversations that we have because in the midst of all this, what I don't want to get lost in this conversation is that this district is still committed above all things, to providing your students with the best educational experience we can. How are you keeping teachers' morale high after taking away stipends, adding another class, making class sizes bigger, et cetera? 
You know, I, I got to tell you, we're doing the best we can. It's difficult. Everyone's having to sacrifice a little. I could ask the same question. How many are going to go home and have difficult conversations around the table tonight when you start to sort of think about when that phone call comes on Sunday night, how might I vote? I mean, it's... We tell them they're doing a great job. We tell them that there's nothing like the experience of changing a child's life. None of us came in this money for the money to begin with. I, I promise you that. We do little things that we can for them here and there. Even those are expensive. Uh, every year we have a, a reception where we honor our folks who've worked for Midway for 5 and 10, 15, 20 years. We have teachers who've worked with us for 40 years. We're cutting costs there, but we still want to pat them on the back. That's a challenge, I'll tell you. And, and it's one that, <clears throat> you know, if I'm not careful, I get a little emotional talking about. I've said several times, our teachers are our heroes. But what I believe to be true about our teachers is that they come to work every day not motivated by money, but motivated by the great privilege and honor it is to work with the students that you send us every day. In addition to that, I would say they're motivated by honoring our community. Those slides I showed you where Midway outperforms everybody for less money, that's not because we're geniuses, but that's because of the families and the community and the people who work with our students when they're not in school. And so, this, I, you know, this, this teacher morale issue, it's no small issue. When the state gives us less money, we have to make tough decisions. Everybody feels the burden of those tough decisions. But I don't want you to have the false impression that our teachers don't love your kids, because they do. And it's why they've dedicated their life to this profession. Do we get any more late-breaking uh, question cards? Okay. In just a second, we're going to be dismissed. Now, you had a comment card. We're going to gather those. Where Do we have comment card buckets, y'all? Okay. So, so the same ladies who greeted you on the way in, handing these cards out, will be on the way out. We want your comment cards in the buckets. I want to remind you of a couple things before we dismiss. We're early in the process. We're collecting data points. These da you know, we're going to get some survey data from you guys. We're going to get some survey data from some teachers. We've talked to our principals. They have an informed opinion. We have an informed opinion. We're going to put all that together. We're going to share it with our board and then we'll take some next steps as we deem uh, necessary based on their guidance and input and your guidance and input. With that, I appreciate everybody for coming out tonight. I hope you have a great evening. Thanks for taking the time to be here. It means a lot.